Hi. Hello. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is, oh, thank you. Um, my name is Francesca Lynn, and I'll be the moderator for this panel, um, which is Feminism, Futurism, and Fantasy. I'm going to go ahead and read the bios of our wonderful panelists first, and then we'll get into some discussion. Yes. Okay. Emma Rios is is based in Spain. She shifted her focus to a mix of both architecture and work at, with small press publishers until she, worked, she started working on comics full-time in 2007. Having worked for Boom Studios and for Marvel Entertainment, Doctor Strange, Amazing Spider-Man, she returned to create her own comics in, in 2013, thanks to Image Comics, where she recently published ID, a solo graphic novel, and co-edited the Island Magazine. She currently co-creates Pretty Deadly with Kelly Sue DeConnick and Mirror with I'm sorry, how do you say her Wei. name? Hui. Hui Lin. Lin. Okay. And then next to Emma, we have Carolyn Nowak. Um, Carolyn graduated from the University of Michigan School of Art and Design, and she's a two-time Ignatz Award winner for Radishes and Diana's Electric Tongue, and she's previously worked with Cartoon Network, Boom Studios, Z2 Comics, and she lives in Ann Arbor. Oh, and her debut, uh, which is right here displayed proudly, um, is, Girl, is Girl Town, which is available right now. Go, go and buy it. Um, and it was published by Top Shelf. Okay, and next is Arminder Daiwal, who's a native of Brampton, Ontario, who received a Bachelor's of Animation from Sheridan College. She now lives in Los Angeles, where she's the director at Disney TV Animation. Previously, she worked as a storyboard director at Cartoon Network and storyboard director on the Nickelodeon show Sanjay and Craig. She has serialized Women World bi-weekly on Instagram since March 2017 and has garnered, garnered over 150,000 followers. Women's Worlds was nominated for an, an Ignatz Award for an outstanding online comic and has and it's now been published in a book by Drawn and Quarterly, which is also available now. Okay. And last but certainly not least, Fiona Smith is um, based in Toronto. Her feminist artwork has been exhibited internationally. Um, Fiona has also collaborated, collaborated with writer and sex educator Corey Silverberg on the kids series What Makes a Baby in 2013 and Sex is a Funny Word in 2015, which is published by Seven Stories Press. She's currently working on the third um, incarnation book in the series, which does not yet have a title. Right, okay. Um, so, when preparing this um, panel, I went ahead and uh, kind of talk, wanted to start talking about a lot of this work was being talked about in, in terms of being feminist work, and I wondered if everyone could maybe ta um, talk about, like, um, do you have a specific moment where you realized you were a feminist, or how did you come to feminism? And anyone can start. <laughs> uh, no one starts. Um, you go. Do it. Shoot. I believe in you. A Your name starts with moment. <laughs> it was June 9th. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's get this going. That's my um, birthday. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it was that day. Um, <laughs> it was a humid night. And, uh, <laughs> so I came up with the idea originally for uh, Woman World during the uh, 2017 uh, Women's March. So that was a moment where I obviously before that knew I was a feminist, <laughs> but like it was a moment where I was exhibiting, I guess, my feminism. And um, uh, I was walking around with friends, we're having a good time. And uh, we all have like funny signs because, you know, that's what you're there for, really, <laughs> is the funny signs. And uh, <laughs> that's the only reason. I, like I spent forever thinking about mine. Um, and then we post them later online. And you know, it's a great day. It's a women's march. We're all excited. It was really peaceful and lovely. And there's all these like horrible people online who, like on Twitter, start like being like, "What are you doing? What do you need a march for?" Blah blah. Um, so that was the moment I realized, like, oh, everyone's not like me, and this isn't, like, a peaceful word, I guess. So that's the moment I was reminded that I'm a feminist. Yeah. Um, I can remember not being a feminist, actually, oh, like, way okay. better than I remember, like, the moment that someone, that I, like, had the realization, because, like, I don't know, it's a fraught label, I guess, um, and I was always, like... Probably until I was like 22, I was like, I'm, I'm too cool to be a feminist. Like, what's the point in that? And I remember like there was this girl that I went to college with who was a woman's studies minor and she was like constantly talking about feminism. And I remember saying to someone, she calls herself a feminist, but she wears so much eyeliner. Yeah. <laughs> and like, 
Like, I remember being an adult woman and saying this, like, out loud to someone. <laughs> so, like, I don't know when the change happened. It was probably somewhere, like, in the midst of my, like, Tumblr usage. Um, I, I do remember the night I deleted my Reddit account. So, like, I was like... <laughs> So, like, I think that was probably, like, the line that I drew. Um, I, it was, like, three in the morning, and I was having, like, an anxiety attack. And I was like, there's only one way to cure this. <laughs> farewell. Farewell, all my karma. Um, so, yeah, that, that's probably it. Anyways. Okay. I think that being a woman, uh, somehow feminism comes naturally, because you always ask for your rights to be treated as an equal but well, you have been doing that your whole life. But it's true that you, that I think all of us had several faces. Um, like, for example, in my scene in Spain, I belong to a self-publishing association. Um, we were 13, 12 dudes and me. <laughs> so uh, I grew up like this. I drew comics like this. I received compliments like, you drew really nicely because you drew you draw like a man, oh. or th things as shitty as that. Uh, so, you know, there was a moment in which you just wanted to be one more, so you denied that you were a woman. You denied like being treated as one because women were not cool, you know. No. And I remember one moment. Well, in that moment in which uh, I was doing all that. Being the only woman, I was asked so many questions. I was asked, uh, I was demanded by press or small press or something, like media or stuff. Like I, I, uh, that thing keeps happening to me. Uh, I have to speak so much about being a woman, much more about, than about my work, which is like a bit frustrating. But I had that phase in which I decided not to answer any questions about gender, and then. I'm on that, phase, on that phase in which I, uh, I believe if I don't speak, other would do for me. So I would answer everything now. Because I, somehow I grew up and I realized that I have to speak. And there is a thing in Spain now going on. Uh, we have a collective of female comic creators. And we started this thing seven years ago. And I remember perfectly our first assembly in which yeah, well, after a life like working alone as a woman, I suddenly entered in a room in Barcelona's Comic, Comic Con, and that room was full of women, like 50 women sitting there, all of them comic cre comics creators, and uh, yeah, I couldn't speak. That was, that was not the first moment in which I realized I was a feminist, but I, that was the first moment in which I felt as a feminist in a community, and I realized that we were in the front line. So. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Please don't clap. <laughs> uh, I, I was much like uh, Carolyn that I, uh, people were calling my work feminist before I called it myself feminist. And as a young artist, emerging artist, um, I would be an apologist for my work and say, I'm not feminist, I'm a humanist. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> but as I got older, it was like, fuck that. Um, <laughs> and, but I probably realized earlier on, although I wouldn't have named it at the time, uh, when I was a kid, I was raised Roman Catholic, and my, my mom and my two sisters and I would go to church every Sunday, but my dad wouldn't even though he was the patriarch of the house and all, you know, annoying and abusive. And uh, why were we going to church and why wasn't he? Uh, and then later, um, being in an all-girls school in grades seven, eight, and nine, and, and the school went to, or sorry, it went from, no, seven, eight, nine, ten, and the earlier grades weren't allowed to carry purses. All girls school weren't allowed to carry purses, so where were we supposed to put our menstrual supplies? We had to hide them in, in our lunch bags, and that was like, why, what? Also, this is like the late 70s, we had to wear bloomers over our underwear, and there would be bloomer check, which seems very titillating and like unnecessary. <laughs> um, yeah. and, uh, and then finally, uh, on a very, um, 
tragic note, there was an, uh, a terrible incident in Montreal in the late 80s um, called the Montreal Massacre, where 14 um, women engineering students were murdered. Um, and when I first heard about this in the news, I was like, oh, phew, they were engineering students. And then the penny dropped, and I was like, no, they were women. And it was like, okay, I'm a feminist. This is it. This is the road to follow. Well, while I was putting together all of these slides and looking at everyone's images for this panel, which we can go through some of them, um, I, I was struck by like how, just like how diverse the offerings are amongst um, the four people that are here. And it, but I was trying to think of like what the threads and really the three lines are. And what I was thinking was that you're all presenting a very like visionary like perspective. Like you're, you're talking about like the anticipating the future. And I was wondering if you, um, you could talk more about like what, is the, what does it mean to like be like interested in, in these imaginings and what does it mean to yeah to and like what does the future look like um or would, what would you like it to look like and we can go through some things while people are thinking and talking <laughs> what would you like it to look like in your your drawing of the men are extinct <laughs> oh i don't want the men to die off uh, <laughs> um oh geez that's a hard question that's that's a lot to unpack um <laughs> going so fast. I'm going slower. Um, I'm sorry. I should start talking faster. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reason I, I don't know if this answers the question specifically, but um, I kind of felt like, oh, it's just so crazy right now that the only way I can make a comic is if it's some point in the far future, um, in time that I can almost understand better, because uh, it's just a little insane, everything that's happening right now. Um, and then I was also seeing so many um, dystopian future yeah. um, things oh, where, like, um, you know, Handmaid's Tale and stuff, like, hey, that's a, it's not something you put on on, like, Saturday night for a fun time. That's, like, <laughs> something you cry to. And, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty rough. So I just knew that I wanted to make something which was just more utopian. And um, I wanted to make sure I, I didn't ever make it seem like the women hated the men or anything like that. I put a lot of effort into making it seem like they, they miss them and um, they look back with a lot of fondness uh, and appreciate like things like Paul Blart and stuff. It's <laughs> 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 <is> fair. Right? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I don't even know what I'm answering at this point, but, like, but that's the reason I kind of went with so far in the future. Um, it's not a future I specifically am hoping for or want, but it's a feeling I wish we could appreciate now. Um, oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, have you read Why the Last Man? Yeah, fun time. Yeah, it's like I actually really like Woman World, like as a reaction to that. Like, no, it wouldn't be like that, you <laughs> idiot. Um, I did not know that that would garner applause. But um, uh, to answer the question, I mean, Woman World is clearly superior to Why the Last Man. Let's just all agree on that. But. Um, uh, I don't know, you mentioned like there were so many things that were predicting this like dystopic future and I find that so... <laughs> That's so good. See, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, I think like people, people predicting a dystopian future and like writing comics, not just comics, but like writing anything about that kind of thing, I. I don't know, it's just something I can't really get on board with. Like, I'm a vocal opponent of Black Mirror for <laughs> so many reasons. Um, but I don't know, like, it's, for me, like, uh, this is, this is gonna make me sound like I have an enormous ego, which may or may not be accurate, but like, I like to think that like, I can make a comic that is, not utopic, but like just a really like calm, sweet vision of the future. Um, and not necessarily even like from a feminist point of view, just from like an everybody point of view. Um, 
and that maybe like people will read it and be like, what if this is possible? Instead of just like reading something dystopian and getting really, really, really depressed um, and like wanting to give up and stuff like that. Because I don't know, like that attitude is just not helpful. I mean, to each their own, but um, personally, it's like not something that, I don't know, to me, like engages with the world properly. Like that's my personal standpoint, like I said, but um, yeah, that's the end of my talking now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's a, that's a great point. And I love that we invoked the name, like I had written that out in my notes that, of why the last man, because um, yeah, I also have the, I was like, this is all about, there are no, there's only just the one dude, but it's just the comic is about the dude. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah. And everything else is horrible. And <laughs> but I also realized as I sc scroll through, if I scroll through all of um, Aminder's wall, people, other people are talking, there'll be maybe strange laughter happening. <laughs> well, oh, <yeah. laughs> so that's why we pa we've paused on like one of my favorites, which I actually, um, which actually one of my women's studies students sent me um, like the Instagram, like was like, do you know about this? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> this is, this is a, um, but, um, but it does kind of make me start to think of like this idea of genre because I've, I've noticed that um, it's not really necessarily talked about in terms of being like a, sci a science fiction piece where, um, um, and a lot of times women's writing that it seems like it really does like have a legacy of science fiction is maybe not included as such. And I was wondering um, if personal perspectives from each of you of like, do you consider your work science fiction? Is it part of, do you look at old, like other science fiction? And then you guys can talk, please talk to each other about this because I would love to know. Um. I guess I do consider Woman Worlds uh, sci-fi. Um, I'm a huge sci-fi fan. Um, when I was in high school, I read the book. Um, <laughs> so that wasn't laughing at, I read a book. Great. Okay. <laughs> 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 I, was like, I read the book. Um, uh, I read the book uh, Adam's Curse by Brian Sykes, which is about the uh, Y chromosome and how it's actually shortening, and there's a chance that men will actually die off. Uh, in, I think, a million generations. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> nine times soon or anything. Um, and I found it fascinating. And I remember, like, in high school doing, like, a biology project all about it. I didn't get good marks or anything on that. But um, I also was too um, jokey during the entire presentation about men dying off in my <laughs> biology class <laughs> um, and was talked to later. Um, so that is um, where, uh, the, the I guess, the truth or the... the the science fact uh, uh, is coming from for the idea. So there are some things that I can back up. And then I do find it really fun when people <laughs> comment or send me like links and stuff to um, uh, like uh, it's actually possible or hopefully will be possible for humans. They've only tested in animals, but for two females to have a child um, through like bone marrow. It's like really interesting. And I'm hoping to uh, put more of that into my work. I just don't know if I'm smart enough all the time or <laughs> if I have the time for that much research. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'm going to answer both questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that in the kind of work I do is not that I address uh, feminists dire directly, but it's true that I speak about acceptance all the time. Mm. So um, I work uh, in one of my books, I work with Kelly Sue DeConnick, who is like a, quite an icon of the feminism in comics here. Uh, so it is impossible not doing anything uh, non-feminist with, not doing anything feminist with, with her. So, but, but I don't feel like pretty deadly is as political as Speech Planet, for example. And ID and Mirror I, are quite political themselves, but it's not that they address they, they address like these questions like directly. It's more, it's as if like I really try to talk about discrimination, but I want to do it like in a way in which it kind it kind of stays, you know, without shouting. Uh, so I don't know if you know a show, the, an anime show that was called Yuri on Ice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> years back. Okay. Uh, I think that show was gorgeous because 
they address this question of homosexuality from the most regular point of view. Uh, there is a scene in which the two main characters who are in love, uh, one of them gives the other a ring. Mm -hmm. and nobody gets surprised, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. like the, super, the most regular thing, like for everyone there. Uh, nobody thinks it's special. Nobody thinks like it's out of context. Nobody thinks, you know? So I think that right now, that could be kind of revolutionary, like treat abnormal things, not abnormal, but you understand what I say, like things that can surprise people or think, oh, this is so cool, but instead of saying, this is so cool, it's saying, okay, this is normal. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's some kind of revolution there. So I really try to do my comics without thinking about the genitals or thinking about uh, or, or without trying to remark things that are normal, making them special. So that, I hope the future could be like that in general. And yeah, I think I, I work on science, science fiction, especially when I write, because, well, there are several, several reasons. One of them is because for me, it's, it's easier to speak about myself with a bit of, out of context, you know, like with a bit of distance, it's easier for me to project because I'm quite an introvert. So it's like for me, it's a bit easier to project myself in other kind of characters. Like I always work with core stories with different characters, but all of them uh, are very connected with myself. Um, and this thing about working with science fiction is like, it gives you the perfect metaphor to speak about life, how it is now, um, to make assumptions or to imagine things or futures or stuff. And then the other one is because I'm speaking in a, I'm writing in a second language because I'm a Spanish. So even if I can do it, uh, as you can hear me, I have a thick accent and you know, like <laughs> my tongue gets stuck from time to time and I, may, I make weird constructions sometimes. So um, there is, there is no way, no matter how much I study English or anything, to catch all the tone uh, because I'm not living here. So working on sci-fi allows me to treat language in a more neutral way, as if I don't need to use accents or locations or that stuff. So it makes things easier. And also allows me to also like treat this use of language more democratically, kind of. So, yeah, that's, that's that. Uh, so, so I work in many genres, not specifically just science fiction. Um, it, like the kids' books or sex education, the ones with Corey Silverberg. And, oh, I gotta mention that um, there's a collection of my comics through Koyama Press called Somnambulance, which goes back to my, my schoolwork and up to last year, and that's available at the Koyama Press table. And I'll be signing there later. But, um, uh, but I did do a science fiction uh, book for kids eight to 10 graphic novel called The Never Wars, and it's definitely on the dystopian tip where babies aren't being born anymore, a very familiar sci-fi trope. Um, and these three teenagers um, solve a 60-year-old mystery and save the world because they discover the first successful clone. Um, and the my next uh, graphic novel outside of working with uh, Corey Silverberg will also be a science fiction about um, this post-apocalyptic world peopled by uh, different tribes of women and non-binary gendered folks and they're embattled with each other and the planet is being destroyed by asteroids and um, it's total mayhem um, and ultimately it's about uh, kind of investigating trauma and resilience and um, and in a recent interview, I was asked, uh, was I creating this story in reaction to, to male writing because there's an absence of men in the story? And I was like, no, I'm not even writing it with that in mind. I'm writing it um, from uh, creating new storylines and new um, 
not as a reaction, but alongside and a different perspective. And it's not always about um, um, commentary on, you know, the patriarchy. It's some, it's its own it's its own thing. Um, so uh, I love science fiction. I'm sure, you know, I'm super excited about working on this this book. It's been going for a couple of years, but it'll probably take a couple more years. And it's called Spin Barkite, which refers to the the um, it's it's a medical term for the mucus that's present in the vagina uh, when a body is most fertile. So it means elasticity and that gooiness. So like resilience and creativity and survival. <laughs> I want to read that. Yeah. Like really, like now. <laughs> I was also wondering what I know. We talked about some, some maybe some dystopic themes or sci-fi that we were not that into. I know Carolyn mentioned you know, Black Mirror, yeah. and also we mentioned Why, Why Last Man. But what maybe are you like inspired by, or things that you've read and does not have to be comics that you like? Out of yeah. Um, I mean, I've always been a huge Star Trek fan, like, since birth, probably. I don't know. I I mean, I like, I've always, not that Star Trek gets everything right all the time, but um, I've always just, like, really enjoyed thinking about a future like that, like a, um, you know, like this moneyless meritocracy where everyone is just, like, really interested in science and exploration and being kind to one another. Um, so I don't know. I like. I will forever draw on that. I'm sure. Um, Star Trek is actually the reason I drink Earl Grey tea. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got so used to that as like a teenager that like still. It's the reason there. that I play trombone. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I don't. <laughs> it's the reason I, don't. I can't sit in chairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean that's like. A big one for me and then I just really like um, very like loose speculative fiction um, like uh, Kelly Link is um, my absolute favorite author um, and of course like Kazuo uh, Ishiguro um, that kind of stuff that kind of sci-fi stuff that he gets up to um, while he polishes his Nobel Prize uh, <laughs> uh, yeah that's those are some big ones um, yeah. Oh, no, no, sorry. Right. I was like, a lot of apologizing. Um, <laughs> uh, Star Trek, definitely. I haven't watched Discovery though yet. I'm it sucks. Oh no! <laughs> no. <I'm> sorry. Um, <laughs> I was just it. waiting a little longer. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, give but it cool. A try. Thanks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me form my own opinion and no. <laughs> argue with you online. <laughs> um, we'll get our chance. <laughs> I love Doctor Who. Uh, that's something that's just, uh, I was raised in England and um, my dad used to watch it in the 70s and like then I grew up it, with it in like the 80s and 90s. Um, my sister was actually once sent home from school because she got scared that there was a Dalek. Um, <laughs> and it was actually a garbage can. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and she had, she was really smart. She ran down some stairs, because at that point, <laughs> she was like, they can't go downstairs. That's um, so that's yeah. <laughs> pretty mm -hmm. prominent in our, in our lives. Um, uh, what else do I love? Like, I love funny sci-fi. I, I love Futurama, stuff like that. Um, and then I d there is a special place in my heart for just like post-apocalyptic, like, outrage porn kind of things where it's like everything's gone wrong um like i have a secret love of like water world oh, water. <laughs> 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 um, i think we just became best like friends <laughs> i love it. love no i love it <laughs> um that needs a remake right <laughs> um um, and then as much as I made fun of like Handmaid's Tale, like I do love that book and uh, there's, yeah, there's something enjoyable about seeing like this dark dystopian future and being like, no, things can't go, like get this bad. Um, so yeah, like sci-fi is my go-to, whether it be books, any sort of media, I guess. It's the stuff I love. 
Yeah, for me, I love it too. I love Ursula Le Guin. I love Tavia Butler. I'm crazy for the anime of the of the 80s. If you take a look at my Twitter account, you will only see Gundam. <laughs> and uh, I grew up with Captain Harlock, wanting to be a space anarchist. And I went, uh, I'm crazy about like these crazy shows, like totally epic, like Legend of Galactic Heroes of, you know, like British people in space, <laughs> or I don't know, Napoleonic Wars in space, or yeah, Dune. Yeah, I'm totally, I really like it. I'm not such a fan of Star Trek, but I am. <laughs> but I really like Babylon 5. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't want to apologize, but it's true. Like, I was so hooked to that stuff in the 90s. And Alien is my favorite film, probably. I don't know. So, yeah, I'm totally a sucker for sci fi. <laughs> I guess I'm just going to repeat what everybody else said Star <laughs> Trek, uh, Tom Baker, um, yeah. Mobius Maybe. was huge. Cool. Especially yeah. like. Um, <laughs> Uh, drawing futuristic landscapes that are deserts, because that's what Spin Bark is going to be. It'd be so easy to draw. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, Dune was huge yeah. for me. Yeah. And the, I, I, I always pronounced it Ben Gesserit. Is it Benny Gesserit? Benny Gesserit. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> it was all about that. The, the Messiah thing, you know, it gets kind of tire, tiring and. And I guess Star Wars has that too, even though I love Star Wars. But mm -hmm. yeah, at least Star Trek doesn't have that. <laughs> yeah, I always forget about Euro comics because I grew up with them. But uh, yeah, Moebius is what's like, what's very important in my life too. Um, yeah, heavy metal, 1984, all that kind of magazines were very important in my life too. Yep. Too. Yeah, and I could of course talk to all of you all day and have a million of my questions, but I was wondering if you had questions for each other that you could talk about, or? I just wanted to recommend one more book. Oh, yeah. um, uh, it's Ignatz nominated this year, it's called Antigon, it's from Koyama Press. It's like one of my favorite sci-fi stories I've ever read, so. Um, and it is like dystopic. I mean, I know I like, drew a hard line on the dystopia thing earlier. I was just being hyperbolic. I'll totally read dystopia stuff. And also, sorry if you like Star Trek Discovery. I only watched the first two episodes. It's, it might be fine. I don't know. I don't know. I, but I did not like what I saw. So. Uh, and I'm also going to click through. There might be more funny comics. So. <laughs> I'd like to recommend just one thing. Just one thing. It's like it, that you read like classic soyo manga from the 70s because there were a lot of women doing sci-fi there and um, messing up with genre and homosexuality and all that, so. I think it was nice. So we now have a very long reading list. I know um, I know that some of you had like questions for each other or comments, anything. If not, I can keep asking, badgering you. <laughs> No, uh, well, I, okay. I I just wanted to make a comment about Woman World. Um, it's very good. No, um, <laughs> the, I this is going to go the discovery route. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've only read two of two panels. Um, <laughs> no, but I was just thinking about it, and I really like. I mean, it's like dy dystopian, but it's also. I mean, it's funny. Like, it's not. It's not dystopian. That's it takes not what I was going for. That's not, not funny. Oh, <laughs> that's not it wasn't supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> Don't you take Paul Blart references very seriously? Um, no, I like that it's funny because I don't know if it if it wasn't if it was like very like if the women were successful but it was also still very sad it would be like a little bit harder to read like it's so because it's so funny it's like really digestible and it still makes you think i think like yeah. i don't know it's still it's still like to me highlights um feminist issues but in a in like a friendly way that everybody can enjoy <laughs> you know um not that you can't enjoy them <laughs> otherwise but um i don't know i think it's just really just a very effective comic that wasn't a question it was just a comment. <laughs> yeah, i was like oh, i was just sitting right. here thinking about it oh thank you i i think that's the only um that's just how my brain works as mm -hmm. well is like i just like 
I've always worked in comedy, so um, it's like really strange for me to do anything which is just serious and like it just doesn't feel right. So that's just always been my voice, and I al always wanted to get across um, how I felt about feminism, which was just like it's a good time for yeah. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like that was the feeling I wanted to get. Across. We're not trying to be mean. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we are. Um, <laughs> Uh, can you change the slide? This comic is oh, yeah. so old. Okay, that's good. That's fine. This is probably out of context, right? Please. But it's um, that um, I'm enjoying being a feminist right now, but I'm also very weary in general because I am feeling, well, I think I mentioned to you in, a, in an email, but... Uh, I'm feeling that more and more, uh, it's as if like capitalism is still in our feminism, okay. as if uh, it's starting to become some kind of product to sell. Oh. Mm. Uh, so this made me feel very worried in general, as if we are sold films as feminists without being feminist. Uh, we see stuff uh, that we should get like excited about and then it's like so bling, you know? So, I don't know, I get angrier <laughs> about like last thing, like maybe I shouldn't speak about this, but there's like the last film I got very angry about uh, was Annihilation. Ugh. I don't know if you just saw it. I read the novel and I think, the novel is cool, but uh, I think it has a few, a few problems, like from my point of view, but I enjoy it. But the film is like, the only thing they, the novel did well, was like removing all the male characters. <laughs> uh, the protagonists were the women because it was about that. And then the film brought the husband and turned everything into some kind of marital drama mm -hmm. that I couldn't understand. So it, it got me completely crazy. Like, <laughs> so you want to deconstruct this story and um, give your imprint thing here, like the person who was doing the film, and then you bring the, the dude back. Because we can't have <laughs> a film without strong male protagonist. You know, like, come on, give me a break. You know? <laughs> so it is that stuff. Um, so yeah, it makes me feel very weary. Like, like if, if feminism starts to be stolen and try to look like a trend or something instead of our philosophy is like it brings like more reactionary movements and it can get paid away. So it's like I'm very worried about that stuff right now. So I just wanted to make the comment. I think that's that's a really valid fear. I also hated annihilation. We we got it under control, okay. Um, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, don't correct me if I'm wrong. I'm I have the microphone. Um, but uh, I think the same guy did Ex Machina. Yeah, um, that's true. <laughs> thank you. Um, and there's a story in this book called Diana's Electric Tongue about a woman who buys a male coded sex robot. And whenever anyone is like, how'd you come up with that idea? I usually name drop Ex Machina because I hated that movie so, so much. <laughs> um, like I thought, it, like I was really excited about the movie because like, just, like ex it's supposed to be about exploring like the potential of AI, but instead it was just like, hey, what if you saw her boobs? <laughs> Like it's it, it, like there is no reason why that movie needed to be so fucky. Like, and and that's all it, that's all it became in the end. Like you're just totally invalidating like any sort of like interesting point you're trying to make because like I just can't stop. Like in the end, like I don't want to spoil it, even though it's bad, but <laughs> and I won't. But um, but I do feel like it was marketed in the same way. Like I think that director uh, slash writer like thinks he's doing good because he's like, this is a strong and complex female character, but it's like, the context also matters, bro. Um, but you talking about using feminism, feminism as a marketing strategy um, reminds me of the Disney live action Beating the Beast, which is oh, an yes. atrocious, atrocious piece of trash. But I just remember like, 
I remember seeing people on my Facebook feed like gleefully sharing ads for that movie because there was some stupid ass BuzzFeed article that was like, Emma Watson won't be wearing a corset in this movie. And I'm like, oh wow, that rail thin actress is refusing to wear a corset. Pack it up, guys. It's done. And it's like they were using they were basically using that boring, boring, stupid story as a marketing tool, like bot like distributing it through a like via BuzzFeed and via like whoever, like whatever idiots I'm friends with on Facebook, like to be like, wow, you should really go see this movie. And then there's like a really stupid part. There's a really stupid part in that movie where like um, Belle is teaching another, like a little girl to read. And this like man comes up, he's like, teaching other women to read? This is ridiculous. I'm like, oh, thanks, Disney. You're really like pointing out like the literacy, like the women's literacy problems in this fantasy France, like, like I don't know, but but Disney does that shit all the time, and they're evil, and don't ever fall for it. Don't share their stupid articles about like how feminist Cinderella is because she refused to whiten her teeth or whatever. I don't know. Like, <laughs> it's so much bullshit like that. Like, congratulate us. We showed like one dimple of cellulite. Can you believe it? <laughs> I just ugh. I think I think this is a good point to get some um, questions from the audience and also like make our list of things that we're gonna hate watch later. <laughs> so there are microphones in the back. If people could like head towards, um, and then I guess I'll point. <laughs> I also want to add as someone who works at Disney TV. Oh, right sorry. Now. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> I knew that. I already I knew that, actually. I, I feel like I have to answer something. You're, I mean, I actually haven't seen any of those, so They're bad. I have no plans to watch Beauty and the Beast. Um, <clears throat> it is, like, it's surprising how much thought goes, like, it, in a, like, a room, secret room somewhere on Disney, like, a, a group of, like, old men, like, make a whole bunch of these decisions yeah. on how to market something, and it is really scary. Yeah. And we have to, yeah, take back the word feminist and stuff, and, um, yeah, Disney is a little evil. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if anyone is, basically, if someone is trying to make money, yeah, um, just be wary, because, I mean, Capitalism thrives on the self-loathing of women. So <laughs> let's just all remember that. It's yeah. not our friend. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have um, the woman with the um, green shirt, please? Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm not going to spoil Ex Machina because that seems to be a panelist decision. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing that really disturbed me about that movie was the lack of solidarity between the female coded characters. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, and that sort of reminds me of what Emma was talking about with the, um, the group of female comics artists um, and how that was a really big moment for you in your feminism. Um, so I was wondering if you guys had, could share like, <laughs> what it's like to be a feminist comics artist and interact with other feminist comics artists or like what is there like a um a, a secret cabal, cabal? yeah <laughs> um yeah what does that yes. look like right now a coven perhaps? how does that how does that influence your work okay um it's great um, I mean, this this book, um, it's like just all about like women being friends with each other and it's not even a thing I did on purpose. It's just like the life that I lead. Um, and particularly in the comic scene because that's where I've made a lot of my female friends. Like pretty much all of my best like women friends have come from comics. And I guess my best man friends too, but eh, we're not talking about them. Um, no, it's great because I mean like Harassment is a big problem, like pretty much in any industry and like in comic, I don't want to say in particular, but like also in comics. And people like come to come, I've like heard horrible stories about uh, about people being harassed at conventions and in other contexts. And I'm like, that's never happened to me. And then I realized it's because like, I only hang out with nice young women. <laughs> and which is uh, pretty much like, I don't know, I recommend it. Um, I, I, I totally recommend it, um, but I don't know, it's fantastic. We like find so much strength in each other, really. Um, strength and encouragement and, 
I don't know. We're all so nice to each other. It's <laughs> just, just, it's just the best. <laughs> Anyways. Um, yeah, it, it is. It is. It's the best. Uh, I love it. Um, uh, I'm really close friends with a uh, Megan Dong, who's like an amazing comics artist, and she actually has a comic. After we had a really long discussion about um, just how hard it is to even bring up the word feminist online, uh, and it's just this image of her her main character. Um, it's the shark. And he goes into a forest and it's like all alone. There's no one around, and then just quietly says feminism and then a whole bunch of people appear and they're like actually I have an opinion about that um <laughs> it was a great conversation so we're having like I think it's a great time to um make art based off of like you know experiences like that we have online there's a million ways to harass someone now um and then on top of that there's now with the the me too movement there's a lot more um female solidarity happening I think it's a good time to me, it was quite quite life changing. I start to working with women. Like um, I worked with men before, with men before, and had no problem with that. But when I remember, like being at Marvel, um, that I was like under much pressure and all that, and I was feeling like very small there and all. And when I came up with this work with Kalisu for Offspring. Uh, it suddenly changed my income to something stronger. Like uh, I, I dared to try to push myself further, like uh, because I felt like safer. I don't know how, but it's like it, for me, it, it was great. Um, then with Hui, uh, the thing is like we've been friends like 14 years already. Um, and yeah, my my relationship with her is like super deep. And when you do a, some, when you do a comic with somebody, the way we do is like it's totally collaborative. So it's like uh, you need somebody who you trust a lot. And so yeah, I don't know. It's like I'm working with two women right now, and and I wouldn't change it for the world. Like I feel I feel like a bit different, like doing that. Like uh, I feel like we are doing something good or that we are like trying to to show that 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 it's a bit different like that well thank you oh and we are we have a, a few more minutes to take up i'm going to try and what take a few fiona? oh, oh. <laughs> so sorry fiona uh, I, I was just going to add um you know you see somebody like if I see Jillian Tamaki at a party, it isn't like, hey, feminist. <laughs> but, but it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a knowing thing. And, and I teach comics, too. And, and the majority of the class will be uh, uh, female students or non-binary students. And they're creating work about feminism, but maybe not using the F word, creating auto-bio work about feminism and about their lives and about gender. And yeah, it's exciting times. That is the yes. only way I'm greeting you now at parties. Like, hey, feminist. <laughs> hey, feminist. <laughs> okay, can we have the next question, please? Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't really like the term virtue signaling. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I mean, just like in general, but I, I do understand what it means in this context. Um, and for me, it's more like, like it's less virtue signaling and more just like marketing. Like it's just such clear marketing. And I think, um, I think maybe, I don't know if there is a clear line necessarily because I do think that there are things that are obnoxiously marketed as feminist um, <clears throat> Star Wars <laughs> these days that like, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I think that, that Disney really gets off on the blowback from that kind of stuff where they're like, look, it's really feminist because it made a lot of people angry. And it's like, no, maybe those people are just like really stupid and so, too sensitive about like their boy movie getting, never, I don't want to talk about Star Wars. Um, um, but I think it, it's, 
it's really a lot about like the the money like where's the money coming from where's the money going and like i don't know like if it's american apparel doesn't exist anymore right but if American Apparel came out with any clothes that were like, I'm a feminist, well, like, like I have a, mm -hmm. I have a hairy bush or whatever, like if they came out with like something like that, that would, like so, so clearly be like, not something that, I don't want to say real feminist. I don't know. It would, like, Nothing it's the money. It's the money. Uh, yeah, I think like, I think it's it's mostly like where the money is going which is an impossible thing to track. But also, like, um, there's just, like, a level of engagement with feminist ideas that that should happen if you're going to pretend to do that at all. Like, don't just be like, oh, I'm a man and I don't like it when women read, and then just, like, drop it forever. Um, I don't know. Unfortunately, since we are on a tight Sorry. schedule, we are we are about just about at time. But I'd really like to thank our panelists today, and I think our audience. I'm really sorry for any questions. Please catch them while they're at their tables and buy their books. Buy my book. <laughs> it looks like this. <laughs>